Enter the Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings. Changing it up for today. Super Bowl on the way. I figured we'd talk about the state of the sports betting industry. Some of the content stuff that goes behind it. I asked for questions. Ton of questions came in. So if you're watching this and didn't ask a question, but you do want to ask a question that is not answered in this show, leave it in the comment section. And maybe we'll reconvene in a month or so and... Do the same thing all over again and try to answer as many of these questions as possible. Reminder to smash the like to the episode and sub to Mayo Media Network. If you just want the audio version, that's easy. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you can find both links down in the description. Just search Pat Mayo Experience on either platform and be generous. Sub, turn on the notifications, leave a five-star review. We are there as well. Cam Stewart is off this week. You know, he had to go in to see how his hernia was. Rob, it's not completely, it, it didn't need emergency surgery so cam is just recovering but yeah we give him the give cam the week off he needs a week off yeah for sure i mean he sounds uh pretty beat down on some of these shows in the in the morning so uh hope hope he has a quick recovery hopefully that discoloration of whatever ball he has growing inside of him goes away at some point and uh, i definitely wish uh, the raging redhead the best so let's talk about where sports betting is at right now and we'll try to mainly focus this on u.s based but obviously we're both in canada so we have a different bit of slant like people ask me about taxes on winnings which is hilarious thinking that i actually win on anything so how would i know but we both live in a country where those are not taxable unless your profession is professional sports better isn't that right it is now listen tax advice is always i would always tell someone to consult an accountant you, you know, seek legal advice, so on and so forth, because each province is different. Each state in the U.S. is different. There are workarounds to a lot of these situations, depending on how much you actually make gambling uh, or betting on sports versus what you're making elsewhere. There's a, a lot of ways that, listen, everyone does this in their regular taxes on an annual basis. They try to see how they can maximize their return. The same thing goes for sports betting. So, uh, I, I, I can't speak to that, nor would I or like advise someone on what they can or can't do, uh, because it's going to be a different situation for every single person, depending on their own personal situation when they go file their taxes. But definitely, um, it, it's nice to be in Canada in terms of, uh, you know, what what I have to claim and what I don't have to claim. But if you're in U.S. states, you can definitely seek uh, advice from an accountant in order to maximize your tax return as well. So now that the proliferation of legalized sports betting is, I think it's 35 states now across the United States, that do you think we're in a, do you think betters are in a better position than they were with only offshores to go to? Because I feel like they are. Well, yes. So from a safety point of view, for sure. So one thing when you're betting offshore, and there's obviously people who still bet offshore because they're, you know, accustomed to that product prior to regulation. Um, there are some good offshore products, but there's no policing of the offshore products. If an offshore decides to void your bet, they can basically make up any reason that they want to to void that bet. Now, it's bad business for them, obviously, and I'm not suggesting every offshore sportsbook is going to do that, but you have no claim to your money if something happens. If that sportsbook goes under or they just take off with your money, you have no claim to that money because you're betting into an unregulated market. Whereas with the regulated market and the emergence of these regulated licensed sports books, you do have a claim. You can appeal to different states, uh, in provinces, uh, gaming commissions, so on and so forth, regulators, um, if anything goes wrong or you feel like you're treated unfairly. So it's more advantageous for the player in that perspective, but also there's just a lot more selection out there nowadays as well, which. Uh, is is advantageous for the better, both from a an experience point of view. You obviously want to bet with a good product, something that's catered to you. You know, if you're if there's only an X amount of offshores and only a certain amount of them offer, let's say, live betting on the sport that you like. Well, I mean, that's not going to be a great experience. But now when you have regulated market, more options become available, more bonuses become available to help you bet your money uh, uh, in a more friendly way, not lose it as quickly um, if you are losing better in the long term. And honestly, if you're a winning better or you're like borderline winning better, you now have all these options available to shop 
prices and go to the sports book that's offering you the best price. So I think it's a very good time for sports bettors for the most part. Uh, especially a recreational better who has just like a million options available to them now. You, you talked about the bonuses and I, I see people get, it's, it's weird. People sometimes get up in arms about bonuses or even boosted odds or anything like that over at the hammer dot bet, which everyone should go check out right now. You got, I think you guys have a tracker uh, where you just kind of play whatever the random boost is of the day or something like, I know it's some conceit like that and it's like a big time winner. So th there's this, there's this thing in, in, like, there's this, there's notion in the space. I don't know where it started that the sports books are trying to bait you or trap you into betting these odds boosts and they'll boost an odd. They'll make it look attractive and it ends up being a bad bet. I think this started with the Justin Herbert game where he was boosted like to, to from minus 800 to just score a touchdown, to throw a touchdown to plus 100. And I think he lost. And, and I think that's where it all started. Like, Oh, this is a big trap. I've consulted with sports books in the past, so I've I've worked on the other side of the counter. I know how this stuff works. Odds boosts are generally a marketing tactic by the sports book to try to get you in the door, to try to make your experience a little bit better. They're actually throwing you a bone because a lot of times what happens is people deposit in a sports book, they lose all their money, and then they they had a horrible experience, they disappear. And they're gone. You're never going to get that customer back. So by offering these steady odds boosts, it allows people to, you know, accumulate more of a bankroll or like decline their bankroll at a slower rate. So that's the real goal of the odds boost. It's a marketing tactic, but you can definitely, as a better, use these to your advantage. So Pat, what you're talking about is at Betstamp, we track something um, in the Betstamp app under the find better section called uh, Bonanza Bets, which is someone and literally like an intern of ours who goes through the sportsbook odds boosts in Ontario every single day and he tracks the ones that are plus EV odds boost. So now he's not betting every single one, but what he's doing is he's looking at this boost, he's comparing it to all the prices in market and saying, oh, this is a great price. Let's track it. And it's I, I believe as of yesterday it was like 48% ROI since we started tracking on April 4th. 2022 so definitely don't fall for like the the sports books are trying to bait you type of thing this is something you can use to your advantage you should use it to your advantage to grow your bankroll obviously there's limits in place sports books not gonna let you bet a thousand dollars on these odds boosts usually it's 50 bucks 75 bucks 100 bucks sometimes even smaller but there is a lot of money you're leaving on the table if you don't take advantage of those I've watched this twice now uh, throughout the course of my career because obviously I started in 2009 and it was season-long fantasy is essentially mm -hmm. the only thing that you would really talk about. I did do, I mean, the, the spread pick show that I do with Jeff and Tim used to be a spread picks column that I would just do with Tim and I would do all the write-ups and Tim and I would make our picks. Then we turned it into podcast form. That was really the only betting stuff that I really did. And then in 2000, end of 2013, 2014, Daily Fantasy hits the map. And then you have DraftKings and FanDuel and Draft Day and Draft Street and uh, what was the one in Ontario? F Fantasy Feud, that was another one that you could go to. But we then saw the takeoff of how much money was coming into the space to pay for shows, to pay for advertising. Just remember that ru rush of, before it got banned in New York for that uh, short period of time, remember the amount of commercials for FanDuel and DraftKings that you would see at all times? I think their marketing budgets per month were something like $30 million in ad space. It was insane. And you saw that entire rush. And then it kind of went away for a while. But then it came back in a big way when sports betting, came in and you know, New York has dropped. We can talk more about New York in a second, but still no California, still no Texas. I think Florida had it for a day or something like that. And then mobile sports betting kind of went away again. But I think that we'll see another gold rush of advertising and money into the space once one, two, or even all three of those, specifically Texas and California, although California just got voted down. Texas seems to be back on the agenda for this year. Not sure how it's going to pass, but we'll, we'll see if that ends up working out. I would expect I think that's what sports books are waiting for, for the next big flood of money to come in. But it does feel like a lot of the money has dried up over the past 18 months or so. I think it's possible that that sports books are just getting wiser with their marketing budgets because 
you can only take a loss for so many years and have your investors be happy with that. Like a lot of these sports books make a ton of revenue, but they still operate at a significant loss because they're putting so much into marketing year in and year out. And I think at this point, brand awareness is not something that DraftKings has to worry about anymore. They don't have to spend the $20 million a month or whatever it was to, you know, just to get their name out there. So from that point of view, I definitely think that sports books are, are becoming a little bit more wise in how they spend their money, which content they're sponsoring. Um, are, are they just trying to get their name out there anymore? Uh, I can tell you from experience, again, uh, I'm a co-owner of Betstamp. We're a licensed affiliate to pretty much every licensed sports book across North America. And we see that firsthand when we're talking to their marketing managers, affiliate reps, in terms of what they're actually willing to spend on. There's an evolution that's taking place. With that said, what they're trying to do is still acquire players. So you might see a lot of more, you know, affiliate deals are still going strong, even though a lot of people were concerned that, oh, they're going to go away at some point in the future. They're going to switch to a revenue share model. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of that just yet, but I think that you're just starting to see a pivot in the way that sports books, like it's no longer a, a throw your money at the wall and see what sticks. It's more of a, this is, you know, a, a, an actual marketing strategy here. This is what we're willing to pay for. By sponsoring this show, we could probably get 50 depositing players over the course of a month rather than by sponsoring this, you know, putting TV commercials out or uh, putting, you know, uh, an advertisement in a hockey arena or whatever. Uh, we may not get that same return. So uh, I, I think it's just been a, a shift in dynamic, Pat in terms of, of what the goals are for these sports books and just being more cognizant of the fact that, hey, we're bringing in a ton of revenue. Why can't we turn a profit? Maybe we need to come cut back on like this needless marketing spend. Well, I always thought that the, and obviously this is going to be different for every single company. The bigger you are, the bigger splash you want to make. But I even see DraftKings with like Kevin Hart commercials and paid appearances. I'm in one of the infomercials that DraftKings runs. It's me and okay. Reed Fowler talking for and. 30 minutes. It's a DraftKings commercial with like paid time and they always put it up in whatever new state ends up getting sports betting pass and making it legal. So I, I remember when Michigan ended up passing, all of a sudden it was like, I'm getting texts from my friends who live in Michigan. It's just like, hey, you're on TV here. I was like, is it that thing that I filmed like five years ago? Is that still running? They're like, oh yeah, that promo code is still in place when it comes down to it. So I, I do feel like the lower level stuff is... Maybe there's no room for the mid-tier stuff. Like, I, the one thing that I don't quite understand, and listen, I'm not a part of the marketing department. I don't know anything about this. But, like, when you have Fox NFL Sunday or ESPN, and you make them talk about the lines, yeah. is that help? I mean, it, I, don't worry about whether it's helping or hurting anyone because that doesn't matter. But when you just have a bunch of people who legitimately don't seem to know what they're talking about, talking about your product, is that a win in the end? Just because they're saying the name? And maybe it is. I don't know. But it feels like it does it a disservice. I would totally agree with you. So, you know, candidly, I, I'm in the space of of accepting sportsbook money, right? I mean, I, I run the Hammer Betting Network and we monetize through accepting sportsbook partnerships. And for me, you know, sort of the pitch that I'll give to every sportsbook is take a look at the content. We are real bettors that are marketing your sportsbook. Like this is a message that resonates with our audience. I'm not practicing stuff that I don't preach. I think people should bet as as many regulated sports books within their means because each sports book, there, there's some sort of advantage for you as a better. Um, and even if you're not in it to win and it's just for entertainment purposes, you'll sustain your bankroll way longer if you're betting at multiple books regardless. But my message to the sports books is like, watch the content. Like we are real betters. And I think that's like, that's my biggest pet peeve in the space, Pat, is seeing the amount of money that's thrown around to content that frankly and this is just my opinion i would call absolute garbage like it's not appealing to anybody in the space whatsoever um whether that's on on twitter tiktok instagram whatever's getting sponsored or even tv like one example i'll use and i'm sorry that it's not you know as doesn't hit home for the american audience but we have hockey night in canada which has been a, a huge thing uh in canada for for the longest of times on saturday night uh, now sponsored, like heavily sponsored by sports books. And there's like a lot of live odds updates throughout the game and someone just appearing on screen telling you what the live odds are. Well, this is servicing literally nobody. <laughs> like th this is either you're a better 
already and you're in tune with what the live odds are because guess what we all have our phones with us and i can just pull up the live odds on my phone while i'm watching a game at any point or i'm like one of the old school like my father for example sitting at home and watching a broadcast and being like what what are these guys talking about odds on my screen for get this the hell away from me and there's like you're you're not really servicing anyone that's in that market who you could probably potentially turn to into a sports better or increase their engagement as a sports better. And it's a fundamental issue. I mean, what happened when regulation first happened was obviously a lot of people saw an opportunity to talk about sports betting. So you get all the big U S TV conglomerates, media companies, CBS sports, Fox, whatever, turning the regular media personalities into sports betting personalities. And that just doesn't work. Like sports bettors do not want to listen to people who they know are BSing them, period. And we still see that happening more and more. And now, obviously, there's a ton of money in the space. So that's just going to attract even more content creators that want to come out and, and, and put out content in the sports betting space. That is frankly horrible. And you start to see all this stuff like reverse line movement and public betting percentages and all this stuff that doesn't work. And somebody sees someone else doing it. And they copy it because there's more money in the space and they can get sponsorships. And it's just like this cyclical run of, of complete garbage. So, I mean, it's very frustrating for me uh, as a pro better myself and someone who makes the major like the majority of my income betting on sports. It's my livelihood. It's, it's almost good for me that all of this nonsense exists in the space, but I still cannot help it and help myself when I, I watch something and I'm like, this is just so bad. How can someone be paying for this? And uh, I, I really don't have the answer, but I think eventually that's going to dry up because, uh, I mean, it, it, the, the, con the content space is just saturated with stuff right now that, in, in my opinion, is uh, a, a complete disaster, Pat. Do we just need to work that through? And we need to let the bad content happen, and then eventually that will stop being funded or it won't get engagement. Because if it gets engagement, then people are going to continue to do it over time and then maybe that stuff will get filtered out then you'll just have a smaller space and then maybe not as much money to go around in the space but more money for the people that are still remaining i think that there's like this general fear from different sports books that if they don't sponsor content or they don't like you know if if I, i'll just pick a random sports book but like if i'm bet mgm and i don't i don't sponsor content or whatever all these players that all this viewership that i might have gotten all those players might go to DraftKings or all those players might go to FanDuel or whatever. And there's like this, it creates like, it's almost like the, like the arms race, right. That happened decades ago, but it's kind of the same in the sports book space where it's like, ah, oh, I'm probably not going to get my value out of this, but what if, what if I don't do this and then DraftKings steps in and sponsors it and then they get all these players and it, it just like, it's like this fear that exists amongst all these books. But like for me, and I'm not a marketing manager for a sports book. I don't handle partnerships or, or whatever. But for me, it would be the content first and foremost. I would want to put my name behind real betting content. I think a lot of what people are chasing nowadays is views, just straight views. And I don't think that's necessarily helpful. Uh, I see a lot of the stuff on, you know, that comes across my timeline on Twitter that gets retweeted and so on and so forth. I'm, and now Twitter actually has like the amount of views um, public available to you and I'll be like, wow, this 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 video got 250k views, or this tweet with this video got 250k views, and I'll watch it and I'll be like, wow, I'd be embarrassed to be the sports book that's actually sponsoring this. Who cares about the views? This is actually horrible. And I'm not a big believer in like the you know, uh, there's no such thing as bad press or whatever. Uh, I, I I like I think there's just a lot of trash out there right now frankly i know it sounds extremely conceited but um I, I i wouldn't want to attach myself to a lot of stuff that's out there i do think that fundamentally that's going to change over time but right now it's still uh, in my opinion pat you know people are still trying to get as many views as possible i think that's the wrong metric that they should be looking at i completely agree and i've had this conversation with a bunch of different people around the industry and just you know because i do consulting work as well uh with mainly from the content end of things of uh, people will ask me it's like how do i increase engagement how do i increase my views how do i increase the things that matter and it's funny that you mentioned the twitter views because that's one that commonly comes up can i keep telling people like i stopped doing 
I used to, whenever we would do a live show, I would do it like we'd run through. What was the name of that uh, platform we used to use, Paul? Uh, Restream? Was that it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on Restream, you could go live to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube all at the same time. We're like, this is perfect. More people can watch us in more places. And we would get a ton of views on Twitter. But those views were absolutely useless. Like, they, they, people, every time that someone scrolled by your video on Twitter meant it got counted as a view. So you'd go looking like the average duration of time. It'd be like two seconds. Like these views don't actually mean anything. So, but what I found is a lot of these companies, like that's something you can actually sell towards. Like it's easier to get views on your video on Twitter rather than YouTube. People have to go to YouTube, click play, or it will auto-populate if you have the app. But generally, if people seek out your video on YouTube, they're actually going to watch it versus the other one where they're most definitely not. 99.8% of people are not watching the video on Twitter. So, but people can boost up these Twitter numbers pretty easily, especially if you boost your post for engagement, pay 30 bucks or whatever it is. And then you can take those numbers and sell off those numbers as legitimate numbers. And some places will buy that those are real numbers. So I get why people do it. I will say it's few and far between. So like, I, again, I deal with many sports books and um, I, I, I'm the CEO of The Hammer. Uh, I, I try to sell YouTube channels or brands to sports books for title sponsorship deals for certain periods of time. And for some, the Twitter views do matter. And for others, the Twitter views don't matter. So it, it's to each their own. For me, I broadcast to Twitter uh, because The Hammer is still very much in its infancy. I mean, we launched in September of 2022. We're inside six months right now. I think the hammer's still in a brand awareness phase where it's beneficial to get that content out onto Twitter and broadcasting there because people see it. They're like, oh, what's this? They'll click into the video for a short period of time. We promote our YouTube channel, so on and so forth. And it, it helps in terms of discoverability of the content altogether. But over time, eventually it'll just be YouTube stuff because I do see that the vast majority of sports books are starting to not care about that all that much um, unless they can broadcast it from their direct social feeds as well, which I mean, again, every sports book has their own goals, um, what they, they value and so on and so forth. But what we're learning now, especially once Elon introduced this new views feature on Twitter, go look at the view on a tweet, uh, just the tweet itself, and then compare it to the number of views of the actual video. And you'll definitely see that there's a lot of things that are, are, are being like, I don't want to say miscounted, but uh, a, a little bit shady in the sense of exactly what you said, Pat, where like somebody just hovering over the video for two seconds and seeing like a short clip of it, uh, it's going to count as a, an overall view. And there's no other engagement metrics that we can see. So for me, I mean, if I'm a sports book, I'm looking to see that the content creators are authentic with the audience. Um I think that's the most important part that like people resonate with whoever's creating the content, that there's some sort of engaging community, whether that's during a live show, people are engaging in the chat, whether that's, you know, if it's tweeted to social, people are engaging on social or so on and so forth. But I'm not looking strictly for views at any point because I think that can be gamed uh, very easily for one. And on top of that, let's be real, people watch videos for different reasons altogether uh, I might see something that catches my eye that comes across my timeline and I might, you know, hover over it and watch for 10 seconds. It's sponsored by a sports book. I'll never consider going to bed at that sports book. Um, it, you know, it's maybe something that was just eye popping to me that I caught or whatever. So um, I, I think we're starting to see sports books that don't put a, a, a whole ton of value in that. Well, I guess it works one of two ways. You hit on some key things a little bit earlier when you talked about the major networks basically having an anchor sit there, read from a teleprompter, and read just what the live odds are for the game. That's it. No, no other color other than here is what the in-game puck line is for Carolina and New Jersey. It is set at whatever it might be. Brought to you by this sports book. And that content is legitimately for no one. That's the networks grabbing the bag and being like, oh, yeah, we do sports. Yeah, well, you can advertise with us. We'll work it in game. Don't worry about that. And I don't know who that gets. Like, it's not because it does seem like the big market that everyone wants to crack as a sportsbook operator is like 
I mean, I have no idea how old your dad is, but like my dad is 55 or 56 on the younger side for someone my age, obviously, but someone who would still be in the market for this. I mean, he doesn't do any sports betting. Guy can barely use a phone. He might as well be 75 years old. But that is the mark because I've dealt so much in the sports betting and golf space that you know the majority of golfers are these like 45 plus 50 plus rich white dudes that you know have disposable income they're actually the perfect target market for sports betting but actually converting them into being a sports better seems realistically like the most challenging thing in the world yeah there's there's just like you know if my dad's watching a broadcast there's there's nothing that's being done that's going to resonate with him right there was never you know, and, and I'm speaking strictly to the Canadian market, but I do spend a lot of time in the U.S. I, I've dealt with the U.S. markets in terms of businesses and so on and so forth. I think this is like a North American wide situation, but nobody really approached sports betting from an educational point of view at any point. Like, obviously, you saw some like very basic stuff, how to bet a money line spread, um, you know, over under teaser, whatever. Most of that content you'll find online. No one in, on, on like TV channels started with the educational side of it it was okay we're regulated sports betting market now let's get somebody on tv giving out picks well you know what is a former nhl player giving out picks on an nhl broadcast like is that resonating with anyone it's not like people they want they're, they're seeking credibility and trust for the most most part so if you're doing a pick segment it's either got to be entertaining it's got to be from someone who's respected it, it there's there's too much out there that is done with no end goal in mind or like no rationale as to here's the demographic that we want to appeal to. Here's how we're going to do it. It just seems like all thrown together. I can speak from experience in having had conversations with the major media networks in Canada about being a sports betting personality and nothing ever amounted to that because of my ideologies on what should be covered on TV in terms of sports betting. Uh, but a, a part a big part of it is and and listen like i don't want to lump everyone into into this one bucket i'm sure there's people that are out there that that aren't lumped into this but you have all these executives at these media companies who frankly don't know sports betting themselves um so that makes it even more challenging for them to to look at the content that they're putting out there and gauge whether or not this is intriguing appealing it's good or not I mean, if they went to social and they just quickly searched, they would probably find that there a lot of people are hating on it. But that's maybe not the best gauge of things because social media can be like that. But overall, when there's a lack of knowledge in the space in terms of sports betting, it's a new industry. No one knows what's good and what's not. Like I can watch you know, Mike Johnson to me is a, a, a excellent NHL analyst. One of the best out there in terms of actually breaking down the game. He's very well spoken great commentator. He appears on some NHL network stuff in the U S some Canadian broadcasts, but if he's going to go on 10 minutes before the game and start picking bets out at FanDuel or DraftKings or whatever, whoever's sponsoring it now, he's not going to do it in a way that is at all appealing to the audience that's watching the game because he's not a sports better himself. He's a hockey expert, but he's not a betting expert. And I think all of this is getting conflated now and people just think that people are these intermoving pieces and you can just plug them in here, plug them in here. I can take a guy off of, off the, the news anchor desk and turn him into a sports betting analyst and whatever and it just doesn't work. And you get all this stuff in the space that is frankly not entertaining, doesn't serve a purpose to the audience. In some cases is actually like encouraging irresponsible gaming which should be the the exact opposite of everything that's airing on TV to the masses. Um, so I, I don't know that anyone that's, I don't like, don't get me wrong. There's people in the space. I make this sound very negative, obviously, because I'm a pessimistic person and, and this kind of stuff frustrates me in general, but there are spots that are doing good stuff out there. I think that they're just few and far between. It would be a pretty easy fix with some of the stuff back when, I was really starting to get into daily fantasy and doing DraftKings, like DFS shows all the time for every different sport. One of the things that I would do for the video version of this show is throw up a glossary term if we use something like chalk. And just like if I would say the word chalk on the screen for 
20 seconds would just be basically a definition of what chalk meant. People could read it. I would make sure it was left up for enough time that even the slowest of readers could go in. I think that there's something to that. I mean, I don't do it anymore because my audience doesn't grow at the same rate that it used to, where just a lot of people who have been around now ever have either stuck around. It grows, you, know, you have your growing peaks at the beginning of every football yep. season uh, when the Masters comes around or generally the two times that my show takes a little leap up in terms of overall audience. But then those people just kind of stick around throughout the course of the years. They kind of know what we're talking about to begin with. I'm not talking to a lot of brand new people all the time. So I've started to take that less into consideration. And it, I mean, that probably helps. That, that probably hurts the overall growth of the show, just being a bit more inside. But you know, I'm very happy with the size of this audience is. And I enjoy doing my show this way more than I used to do it the other way. But if you're going to be on a major TV network, like why not have a Chiron come up that when people are talking about these things, it just has a quick two sentence explanation of what it is. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, there there is an appetite for educational material. Like there actually, there's a lot of people out there that are just scared to get involved in betting because it feels too cumbersome for them. They, they don't know what a money line is. And of course, there's always going to be a segment of the population that knows exactly what, what this is. So you got to determine how do you, how do you do this in a manner that is helpful for everyone? It can be done, but like Pat, we recorded a few years ago <laughs> when you were in Toronto in the studio prior to the NFL season, like the, how to bet the NFL video I'm pretty sure it's still one of your top five most popular videos that you've ever recorded on this channel. There is an appetite for people to learn these concepts. There really is. But it's the the the, the space is just so saturated with the picks. I got, we got to do picks. We got to give out picks, this and that. Like, you know, Cabby is running uh, Sportsnet's team. Cabby's a great guy. I used to work with him at the score back in the game. He's not a... Uh, a season better per se. And, and the emphasis there is on, okay, sports net bets. We got to give out picks. We got to do this. We got to do that. There's, there's way more to sports betting content than just giving out picks. And obviously there is a certain percentage of the population that wants picks. I get it completely, but there's a lot of people that you are basically just kind of shunning at that point, sticking them in the corner and saying, well, now you're going to watch this broadcast and you're going to deal with it and you have no idea what's going on and they're just going to change the channel and they're going to go to something else or they're going to seek out um, something else on a weeknight because they get frustrated with the amount of betting that's on their screen and they have no idea what any of this stuff is. So the, the real secret that, that I don't think anyone has really unlocked yet is how to appeal to like 90% of the viewership of one show and, and, or like a sports broadcast. And I understand that there's like tons of different demographics there and it's a challenge, but I do think it can be done. I think you can work things in from an educational component that people aren't talking about right now. And it's not just like a simple, what is this? What is that? What is that? You can get into some more interesting betting concepts. You can talk about betting from a lens of like, this is what the betting market is saying on this game or um, yeah, something that's still you, interesting it, rather this than is the it. pick. Th this is it right now. I think, pi I like, listen, I like picks content too. I run a network where we give out picks. No one takes our picks seriously, but that's okay. But why do people still come back and watch these 40 minute shows, two hour shows, whatever it might be. When me, you and Cam sit down every week and give out our best bets for the week, how, what percentage of the people do you think actually care about the picks? 10%? Yeah, it's pretty low. I, I mean, I like to read the comments on all the content that oh I'm a part God. of every don't, week. Don't, don't do and, that. That's a horrible idea. Well, <laughs> well it doesn't. It actually doesn't bother me. Uh, honestly, I agree with you in some sense. Like, it depends on the platform. I think YouTube is like people. Um, it, it's different than Twitter. Let me just put it that way. Like Twitter, I, I barely read the comments on a lot of things. YouTube, I think a lot of it is constructive, right? Like I learned from reading the comments. And when I first started doing this show with you, Pat, years ago, you know, there would be some like comments of like, oh, Rob, like no personality, this and that. And like, I, I'm not an actor, like I'm going to be who I am. But I I, I kind of think about that over the course of the week. And it's like, how can I rile up? How can I? <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, how can I? What's my footprint as part of this show? How can I get this to be the most entertaining? And just by me knowing what Cam's trigger points are and figuring out a way to get to that every show, it's. It, it makes me more endearing and more likable. And it, it makes the, like the camaraderie amongst us three a, a whole lot better. So 
I, I'm not suggesting that there's no market for recreational content. There absolutely is. Like people watch a lot of what you do, Pat, for exactly that. It's the personalities, right? Like how you interact with Jeff and Cust. Like it's gold. A lot of that stuff is gold. And I will watch stuff like that. This serves me like as a as a pro better. Like I'm not improving my betting craft by watching your content. <laughs> I'm just finding entertainment in it. And that's entirely fine. And on top of it, Pat, you come on, you started this show today about talking about like, why do people follow my picks? I lose money, this and that, and so on and so forth. Like you're real with the audience. You, you're not out there, you know, promoting every single golf winner. You'll do that, obviously, because you want to grow and you want to market yourself. But you're real with the audience and you're not you're not selling yourself as something that you're not. Jeff is not doing that. I'm not doing that. Tim's not doing that. Um, you know, Cam's not doing that. We, we we are who we are. And I think that resonates with people. And I'd like to see more of that in the space. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's we're still in the infancy of sports betting here. Like we're only going on, you know, three, four years of regulation in the U S in certain States, Canada's going on like not even a year. This stuff will grow. People will be able to weed out the fluff or filter out the fluff. Eventually. Um, we're just, we're just not at that spot yet. So I, I've tried to use the sponsorship money that I've gotten from DraftKings over the years to create a product that could both be a TV show and something that people have on in the background that they can have a laugh at. That's the content that I'm most comfortable producing. It's a content that I like to listen to. Like you said, I, there's shows that I like to listen to, horrible, horrible picks. Not bad information. That's always the one thing that I wanted to give on this show is I don't want to give bad information out to people, but good information doesn't necessarily translate into good picks all the time. Like, here's the reasoning. It's not, the reasoning's not false. It's just wrong. Uh, but I was trying to look into it this way, and that was the wrong angle, or this happened, or that happened, whatever it might be. But the whole draw to the show is that it's supposed to be light. It's supposed to be entertaining, and something that you want to come and hang out with every single week, or every single day, or how often people go through. If it's just a picks type thing, that should be like 30 seconds, I feel. I mean, more people would consume it. I'll tell you that. Like I, I see content creators in the space who are like, oh, what can I do to, you know, improve this channel or so on and so forth? They're like, oh, the video, the picks videos are too long. Just get to the point. 15, 30 seconds, one minute. Uh, because they're, I, I mean, it all depends, right? Like when you're producing content, when you're creating content, you have to understand like who, who you're, who you're creating that content for. Who's your following going to be? Who are your existing followers? Why do they watch your stuff? And I can go on and create like 15 second pick content, YouTube shorts or whatever, but like that's not going to resonate with my following. They would rather hear me talk about a game for 10 minutes and break it down in full. Why I think something's going to happen. That's just me. There's other people in the space that they can't do a game breakdown like I can because they're not as affluent or well-versed in the sport and they rely on using other things like bet percentages to talk about the games or so on and so forth. And that type of following, yeah, 30 second picks content, they're going to eat it up. There's YouTube channels out there with people that are just releasing, you know, 20 picks videos a day that are short form one to two minute videos that are drawing hundreds of thousands of views because there's an appetite for that. So it's knowing your following when you're producing content, knowing who you want to target for me, and you and you, even you, Pat, like our motivations might be very different. Um, you you approach it like very loosely, um, recreational, you know, gambling content, which, again, like totally fine for me when when I'm when I'm assembling the hammer and what I'm putting on there, I basically am watching back all of these shows and saying what what I personally watch this or enjoy this. And if not, then it's not going to be on my network because either to me, it has to have an entertainment component where people will come back on a weekly basis because they like the personalities or it has to have some actionable info, whether that's educational, how to bet something and like not from the sense of like, oh, 90 percent of the people are betting here and the line's moving the other way. I'm going to go down get down on that. Like, uh, I, I mean, this will I'm kind of going in circles here. It's very long winded. Obviously, people can tell that I'm passionate about content in the space. But I think that there's, you know, you have to set a goal. This is the audience. And then you you, you kind of do what you can to produce content for that audience. But uh, for me, the struggle is just seeing the 
the amount of people that I guess are being led astray. And this is this is my biggest issue with the content creation space. It's people that are being led astray by people who pass themselves off as betting experts. And in in a lot of fields, there are experts. Like if you're going to hire, if you're going to go to see a doctor, like they have to have a degree. If you're going for a surgery, like they had to, you know, they're a surgeon. Like there's, there's, there's things they have to go through to get to that point. If you're going to go tail a pro bettors picks, betting expert picks, there's no like passing point for that. That's anyone off the street can pass themselves off as a betting expert, pro better, you know, pro handicap or whatever you want to put in your Twitter bio, whatever you want to put in your caption on your YouTube video. And that's where a lot of people just fall down the path of, uh, being misled and that's like where I have a serious issue with the space is because there's so many people who who can't tell right from wrong they can't tell that this person is a bullshitter or not and for me like I'd I'd really love to clean that up as best as possible it's kind of like one of my um, my passions and that's why I get confrontational with people um, uh, in like it does not it does not do me a service to get into Twitter arguments with other people but when I see people literally scamming others, it offends me in the sports betting space. So that to me is the stuff that needs to be cleaned up is people who are passing themselves off as something that they are not. That is just fraudulent activity that should not be accepted. Two questions. One, what percentage of people who claim to be pro bettors are actually professional bettors? And if you're really a professional better, why do you do content? Yes. So very good question. Um, I, I don't know the percentage. It's it's extremely small. Now, granted, professional sports better. There's no like real definition for what that means. The way I define it is somebody makes the majority of their income from betting on sports. That's my de definition of a professional sports better. Now, there's also levels of professional sports better, right? There's somebody like I have a friend who's a pro who probably makes fifty or sixty k a year, and he's completely fine with that. It's he treats sports betting like a day job. He's what I would call a top down better. He's looking for stale prices at different sports books, trying to get down a certain amount a day, a certain amount of expected value a day. And that's fine. I know also people who are betting 50 or $60,000 a game that are professional sports bettors that. So there's a, there's like a different level of what that is. But my def, Luke's definition is you're making the majority of your income from actually wagering on sports. And I would say that's way less than 1% of the people out there who actually say that. In terms of myself, it's a very fair question. Everybody has their own motivations and what drives them. And I do very well betting on sports, but I actually don't enjoy it. And if I could make the same amount of money that I do betting on sports in another field, even in a maybe a day job, or something like that, I might consider doing that because there's a lot of stress that comes with betting on sports that I personally do not handle well relative to some other betters in the space. Um, there's a lot of grinding during se like NFL season for me is is rough. Like I'm, I'm working a lot. I'm behind the computer a lot. Like there are points where I, I'm scared to leave my computer for fear that I might miss some injury news and someone else will beat me to a line. So it's not as, you know, there's not as much glory in it as, as glory in it as it seems. For some people, they'd be totally okay with that. They'd say, oh, you sure, I'll, I'll make X amount a year and all I got to do is click some buttons and sit behind a computer desk and whatever. I can totally do that. For me, I'm just kind of burnt out from sports betting. I started in the content space. I, I, I dropped out of university to work as at the score as an intern uh, where I was producing shows for Cam Stewart and Gabe Morenci at that time and eventually became a full-time producer and then a full-time on-air host. This is like my content is my passion. I, I love doing it. Um, it's, it's again, like very conceited, but I like, I like sharing my opinions with others and like, in a sense, hearing my own voice, like hearing myself talk. Uh, I'm not scared to admit it. I'm just an opinionated person. I like to get it out there. So for me, it's a passion. Um, now, 
I'm obviously trying to monetize that passion as well. I'm not like, oh, I'm just going to do content for the sake of doing content. This is great or whatever. No, I'm an individual that's driven by money. I have life goals. I'd like to not be working in my 50s. I'd like to be retired. I like to travel whenever I want to, golf whenever I want to. So I have goals that I've set for myself. And that's kind of the goal for the hammer for me is I can do something I'm passionate about. I can try to monetize it and build it into a business, uh, but it's valid. Like people, you know, people tell, say to me all the time, oh, look at Rob, he's doing, co he's doing all this content now. He must have lost his edge in sports. Well, I mean, my edge is diminishing every single year, but I figure out ways to offset that. Uh, but I'm just not as passionate about sports betting anymore. Like I don't, I don't love the day to day grind like some other people do. There's people who live for it. They get up, they can't wait to get to their desk and, you know, open up their Don Best screen or spank odds or whatever and trade game. Like that's not me. That's not what I, I want to have two hours during the day where I could play video games or, <laughs> you know, I, I can go to the drive. I, I can, I can take four hours in the morning to go play around and I don't have to worry about, um, what I'm missing while I'm away or be glued to my phone like some other betters I'm out on the course with and they're just like phone in hand the entire day and like I don't want to be that person so um, yeah I mean it's it's my it, it's it's a fair criticism of me but like I know what drives me I know what I'm passionate about I have certain goals in life and sports betting might get me there but also might get me to an early grave just because of like the amount of stress anxiety and like to me, that's not living life like, um, you know, very personal experience for me. But the, the death of Kobe Bryant years ago, like really changed my perspective on life because Kobe to me was like this, almost like a God in a sense that like, obviously we all know every human being can, can die. Like that's part of life. But when that happened, it was such a shock to me. And it was just like, it was like a, a I, I went through like a period of self-reflection of what am I doing in life? Like, I might, I have, I'm type one diabetic. I'm probably not going to live till I'm 90 years old. I'm going to have a short, shorter lifespan. Who knows what tomorrow brings? So why am I going to spend 16 hours a day, you know, pretty much 365 days a year sitting at my desk on my phone to grind out this living if I can't enjoy my life? So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's just kind of, the, of where I'm at right now, Pat. Because I've been approached many times over the past, Jesus eight years or so to, hey, come on our tout service. You have a big following. We can sell your picks. I've always felt very uncomfortable about that. I don't mind coming on a free show and giving out losing picks because I'm, I'm betting them. Like I'm losing at the same time. I would have a big problem charging people and then you're taking my, because that, that is part of the aura, right? That's a part of the credibility. If I am paying for your picks, well, I assume that they're good because I'm paying for them. I would never want anyone to make that mistake with me, that they're paying for these picks that just are not good well, whatsoever. I mean, when I say not good, I mean, you're not going to go out and print money, which most of the places are not actually happening. What would you say the, out of the amount of people that bet, or at least let's say even in the content space, what percentage would you say are winning bettors? It would be the industry standard, so 1%. Je you really 1%. out of all people that do content for picks you think that only one percent of those people are winning betters i do really? i strongly believe i, I was going to say I like 20 percent, but okay <laughs> no i i don't i be because most of these people are again like it's what i'm consuming in the space i guess but yeah i mean okay listen maybe maybe a little bit higher but i'm not going higher than two percent like we know from industry-wide studies that about 99% of bettors in the long run are going to lose betting on sports. This is like industry. I'm not making up these numbers. You can, you can go search them online or whatever. There are studies that have been done. 99% of bettors are going to lose. Most content creators are just average bettors. And most pro bet, like I'm, a, why I get a lot of criticism is I think I'm in a unique situation, right? Because most pro bettors, frankly, they don't want to get their, their, their face out there or their name out there. They kind of hide, they keep to themselves. They don't want to put a lot of, of spotlight on what they're doing. It's very rare to see someone that's in my position actually going out there and talking about games and games that they bet where they find edges. People are scared that they're going to give away their edge and so on and so forth. It, it, it's, it's extremely, extremely rare. Now my background plays into it, right? Like, I started a Twitter account in 2010 when I was an intern at the score at Rob Pizzola. 
if I was a pro better at that time, I would never have a Twitter account under my real name. I would have rode off into the sunset. I'd be behind the scenes right now. But I leveraged, you know, my following over time and grew that and grew my own personal brand to the point where, like, this is just who I am. I bet I do. I'm successful at doing it. I also like to do the content side of things. But I, right now, with what I see in the space, Pat, like it's 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 extremely small um and, and and the people that are winning for the most part they're pretty quiet about it or they keep to themselves you you don't see them getting in front of a camera and, and, and talking about their bets or, or or giving away edges or things of that nature so the two premium products that i've been pushing over the years one is fantasy national the other one is run the sims and i think that both those things have things in common to them there are no picks on those sites. Mm -hmm. There are projections on Run the Sims, and I would highly recommend, and we can talk about niche markets in a second. Uh, it's free for the Super Bowl. If you go to runthesims.com, you can create a free account, get the projections, you can customize everything around on there. But XFL and USFL are coming up, and we're selling monthly packages for projections for those. And as we found out with USFL last year, if you have someone doing your projections who has any clue about this league, you are going to print my, like, it's the most ROI I've ever had betting props and playing DraftKings in any sport ever. And I know Justin's on top of XFL and USFL, but both those things are tools. They're tool product that you can customize to help you make better selections. I never wanted to be one on there being like, well, here's how it is here. Here, just you know, press here. It is and here's the picks and here's what you need to play. And you're going to be fine. No, these are research tools so you can inform yourself. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be better or win. You have to figure out how to use them or what works for you. But I, that was always the thing, especially like eight, nine years ago, that I found I had the hardest problem with, especially when it came to like creating Fantasy National with Moose. Shout out Moose, who put all this stuff together, was I would have like 35 tabs open on my Google Chrome being like, well, I need this information from this site and this information from this site. So it's more or less just an efficiency thing. If you're going to research this stuff anyway, why not put it all in one place? That I feel comfortable if the product is good, which I think both those products are really good. I have no problem promoting that. And I think that should be a subscription based service, but that's the extent I'm willing to really go to, to, to shill stuff like that. So here's my opinion uh, on this. And this might be like contrary to a lot of things that I've said so far, but like, I believe that everyone has a right to earn. And like, I believe in capitalism. I'm not anti pick sales. Uh, I would never, I don't want to say I would never recommend buying picks because there's actually like very, very few instances where it can be worthwhile for you to do so. But for the most part, I would never tell someone go out and buy this person's picks or so on and so forth. Um, I think the pick industry is extremely scummy. I do think that there are people out there that do it right, where they keep long term records that are verified and tracked by a third party, where they're not giving out fake lines that don't exist to their clients or they're not betting into market first and then releasing a play a couple minutes later after the line has already moved like there's just too much like this industry is not policed right and that's that's part of the problem i'm not opposed to pick sales i think if people want to sell picks they can the the issue that i have with the space is like most other spaces in the world where there's like fraudulent activity scams they kind of police themselves in some manner or another, whether that's through Google reviews, word of mouth, even like, like Bernie Rip made off like Ponzi scheme. Like there's going to be the FBI knocking on your door at some point if you're, you're doing illegal activity in the, in the financial markets or so on and so forth. But there's no one policing this in the, in the gaming markets. Regulators don't care about this. They only care about what the sports books are doing, how they can make money, so on and so forth. So you get a lot of like these sleazy salesmen, you know, the best, the people who are making the most money from pick sales are not the ones that have the best records from their picks. It's the ones who can market themselves the best. I go to, I went to Cabo for a friend's wedding a couple months ago. I get off the, the airplane in Cabo and I see a big, huge poster of Vegas Dave. <laughs> when I get there, like the biggest prime real estate at the airport is, is, you know, they're promoting the biggest scam handicapper on the entire planet because he's made so much money through his marketing and passing himself off as a winner and buying a hundred thousand dollar futures ticket on every single NFL team every single year and then touting the winner at the end of the season. Like 
great marketing tactic. People fall victim to that. But, you know, tools, pick selling, subscriptions, I'm not lumping them all into one bucket, but ultimately they're a way for someone to monetize in some sense. Like tools themselves may not be, there might be tools that are out there that may not be helpful and people may be, you know, grifting in that sense as well. But it, it to me, it's on the consumer with anything to do their due diligence, right? And it's just harder to do that in the sports betting space. It's why I try to bring awareness to people that are scammers out there and so on and so forth. But I ran a pick site for years. I was the general manager of predictionmachine.com. We were doing over $2 million a year in pick sales. Now I wasn't making all that myself. I was just part of a team, but I basically inherited that business. And it was at the time I inherited a very scummy business promoting short term trends and so on and so forth, selling one day picks packages and stuff like that. I cleaned that up completely. Now, I got out of that after a year because I didn't enjoy doing it, but I like I, I didn't feel any moral dilemma in doing that. I thought that what I was giving to the to the community or what I was selling was worth the value I was selling it okay, for. Okay, so, so, but that's but that's the difference. I'm not against pick sellers either. Uh, what I was saying is that I'm against me selling picks because I'm not good at it, and I would feel bad about it. Right. <laughs> so so you have like a, a moral compass, and I'm with you on that. Like I don't want to do stuff that is going to lead people astray or so on and so forth. Like I'm very confident, Pat, that if I sold picks tomorrow, if I if I went out tomorrow and said, I'm putting up rapazola.com picks packages or whatever, I'm pretty confident I would bring in seven figures a year by doing that. Really? Which is more that I really think you'd bring in seven figures? I that's, do. that's a big number. Why don't you just do it for a year? Then you can put it all in Bitcoin. So, well, there we go. Uh, well, here's the problem, and and it, and it's a moral problem. Okay, so I saw this when I ran Prediction Machine. I'm very confident that I could give out picks that someone could profit from and win. There's two things that are going to happen if I go out tomorrow and start doing pick sales. One is that the market is going to move immediately when I give out a pick. This happens when I do my hockey show on the hammer, edge work on Fridays. As soon as I talk about a game or a prop or whatever, after a couple minutes, the market moves because somebody's going and putting a bunch of money down on it. So now all of a sudden I have my own picks package. I'm releasing picks. I put out, let's just say, uh, Super Bowl is a bad example because it's really hard to move the line, but just a, a regular NFL season game, Eagles plus seven, whatever, it goes out. Within a couple minutes, if not even earlier than that, someone's going to go bet that in market and it's going to move. And probably 10% of the people that I sell to are able to get that number. And then it's going to go to six and a half. And then there's going to be the guy that's a dentist who's you know working a day job, a guy who's in a meeting or whatever, who's going to come out. They're going to see their email. Eagles plus seven. They're going to go to bet it. It's going to be six and a half anywhere, everywhere. And what are they going to do? They're going to go and bet it because the vast majority of them don't have the knowledge of price sensitivity and how important it is to get the exact same number. I'm releasing seven. They're going to get six and a half. In the long run, I have a good bet. They don't have a good bet. They don't know that. That to me is like, I, I, don't, I don't like that personally. So uh, it, it, that's like one of the inherent challenges in the pick sales side of things. And then I'm basically selling a service that I don't believe holds long-term value for a lot of the people that are purchasing it. And that's kind of my, I think there's like a moral obligation on my end to, if I do end up with a product at some point one day, whether that's picks, projections, whatever, I think I have an obligation to figure out how I can make that work for the masses personally. That's just the way I think. Other people don't think like that, but... I get it all the time. Like, you know, I, I do Sunday morning pizza buffet on uh, Forward Progress. I go through the NFL card and I'll say something like, oh, you know, I lean towards Dallas in this game or or I'll say I'll even sometimes let it slip that I bet a team earlier in the week at a different number. And now the line has moved to the point where I wouldn't bet them anymore. And I'll get messages at the end of the day that say, like, thanks. Thanks, Rob, for the, the Cowboys pick. I'll be like, 
what the hell are you talking about? I didn't pick the Cowboys. I didn't, I didn't talk about, they're like, Oh, I could tell by the way you were talking that, that you had already bet them. And I wanted to be on the same side as you. And like, it's cringeworthy to me when that happens because it's someone like they, they think that they've gone through like this great process where like, Oh, I, I got, I won this bet. I was able to tail Rob, but in hindsight, they just have done themselves an even bigger disservice in the long run. So uh, th th these are like the, the things that go through my head. Like people are always like, Oh, Rob, you shill, you shill for sports books. Like how could you promote this sports book? They limit people and so on and so forth. I promote the sports books that I bet at and continue to bet at. And like, I don't care if they limit people because 99% of the people that are going to go bet at DraftKings, for example, are not betting $5,000 a game where this is an issue. They're looking for a good sportsbook experience, a sportsbook that has a lot of markets, a sportsbook that has great in-game wagering, a sportsbook that's going to pay out when you withdraw, good customer service. Like this is what matters to people. So I will promote those sportsbook products because they're useful to other people. Anyways, I've gone on like a complete tangent again, Pat, Pat but uh, I, I think there's like I, I do definitely have like people think I have no morals. It's like the complete opposite of that. I have probably too too many morals where I've cost myself a lot of money in in life because I I think this stuff through way too much. You just want to bet at the sports books that void all your bets if they don't win. Isn't that the move? That's the move right now, right? But you know, listen. <laughs> Hold on, but before you get into it, I do want to say. Here's how bad it has become with the begging for stuff to be voided. I am pro players getting their money back. It's great. If the, if the sports books want to refund everyone's bet at their discretion that doesn't win, that's awesome for the better. That is great news. But I, maybe it's me and you and maybe it's some of the people that we go around with. It's, it's the public begging for it that really bothers me. I want to see them get their money back is the weird thing. Like, I, I don't want to see anyone lose money doing this. But there's just there's something unseemly to me about being like, hey, at DraftKings Sportsbook, my bet didn't win. I, I should get my money back. The game was rigged. I should get my money back. Like, what the fuck are we talking about here? <laughs> of course. And where do you draw the line, right? Like, okay, like LeBron James gets hurt in the first quarter of a game and they're going to avoid all the LeBron props. Well, didn't that affect the Lakers? Didn't it affect every other player in that game in some capacity who now got more minutes or less minutes or whatever because of that injury? Like, where do you draw the line? Is I'm with you, Pat. Like, people think that because I've gone on these tangents about like the people who are begging for their bets voided and refunds that like I'm not pro player. I am a player. I bet into sports books. Obviously, I don't want people to lose money in the long run. That's not my goal when I do content and so on and so forth. I want to see them like win money. And in terms of them getting money back, no problem. But I'm also a believer in fairness in the market and treating players as equals as best as possible. And now you enter a slippery slope, right? Okay, you refund bets one. I posted a screenshot last night. I bet Jeremy Grant over 27 and a half points, rebounds, and assists. He had 22 in the first quarter and got concussed and left the game. I'm not tweeting for refunds or anything like that. That's part of the bet I made. Like, that's just part of it. You, you can bet the under on player props as well. But what happens now is you get sports books picking and choosing, which is within their right, because this is a marketing tactic, obviously. So they can pick and choose when they want a refund. But I don't think that that's fair to the players. So what I would like to see is when I deposit to a sports book, and I'm probably in like the 0.1% of people who do this, but I read the terms and conditions or the house <laughs> rules of the sports book, because for two reasons. But one, you want to know how they're going to grade certain things because it might be more beneficial for you to place bets at one sports book or another, depending on how they're going to grade a certain type of bet. And number two, sometimes you can find edges in the house rules. You might read something and be like, oh, they grade things this way. This is an edge. I'm going to try to exploit that edge. So I'm in the 0.1%. But ultimately, when I bet somewhere, I hold the sports book accountable to their terms, period. And I think if you're a recreational book that feels like you want to think in the best interest of the player and you're willing to void bets and you have a big marketing budget to void bets and refund players, just put it in your terms of service. If a player gets injured in the first six minutes of an NBA game, we will void their overs on player props or whatever. Like you can, you can create house rules for that where now everybody is treated fairly. And this is why people like this is, 
why people are up in arms, but they'll give a refund one day for something. The exact same thing happens the next day, but it's a lesser known player or they had just given a refund the day before and they don't do it the next day. It creates these, ex nobody knows what the expectations are anymore. So I don't blame people for asking for the refunds. Frankly, I think it's a little bit embarrassing and like I wouldn't do it, but I don't blame people. I think it's on the sports books to set the rules um, and, and what the term should be. But my God, it's getting out of hand, Pat. Like it's, it's, there's not a night that goes by where I don't see something about, can I get a refund on this? Or that, like, when did people like lose the ability to admit that they placed a bad bet and just started blaming everything on the sports being rigged? Like, when did this <laughs> phenomenon start to happen? Like, sometimes I place a bet and I'm, I watch the game and I'm like, wow, this is like a really shit bet. It deserved to lose. Now it's just like, oh, this is rigged. Like the refs are calling it this way. This is fixed. Look at this odds boost that DraftKings offered and now it's not going to win because it's fit. Like it's not fixed. Like this is your coin flipping when you're betting for the most part. Sometimes it's going to come out heads. Sometimes it's going to come out tails, but it, it's actually nauseating the amount of, of stuff I see on this um, on Twitter nowadays with like not a day goes by where it's not accusations about the sport being rigged or people just you know, on their knees asking for their money back. It's funny. You mentioned you read all the terms and conditions. The only thing that I look into when I go to a sports book, and it's mainly for golf odds, because I do the majority of my betting on either football or golf, and football is pretty standard by the most part of what's going to pay out. It's pretty self-descriptive. I just look at what dead heat rules are for golf and whether they have them or they don't, because that, there was one book for ages that just didn't have dead heat rules. It was like, oh, this is fantastic. This is where I want to make all my top five, top 10, top 20 bets, because I'm not going to get chopped if a bunch of people tie. Although that is baked into their price a little bit, but it still worked out much better in the long term to bet at that place versus every other place that had the dead heat rules. That was it for me. But what you said about going on to each of the books and reading the terms and conditions reminds me a little bit of one Mr. Tim Andercust, Rob, who every time well, that he, he would get a video game as a kid, he would read the manual from beginning to end. So I'm, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I'm also one of those. I will not play. I have all these board games behind me. I will not play the game until I like literally read the rules through two okay. or three times. I think that's different than you're playing in a board game against other people. He's reading like Super Mario 2 guy, like not like the strategy guide, like the guide being like B means jump. Like you can fucking figure that out. I I will say I did the same thing. Wow. I buy my Sega games. First thing I do, open it instead of popping the cartridge in. It was rule book you know, what are the controls? What are this? What, like, I felt that I could, I'm not pr a person that felt like I could just jump into a game and like learn it on my own. I obviously could have, but I always just felt like I want to learn this before I play it. If if there was YouTube back in the day when I had like Nintendo, uh, Super Nintendo, Sega, I would have like l watched YouTube tutorials of how to play before I actually play. I like, I'm not scared to admit that I share something in common with Cuss there because uh, I was that that same exact kid. Let's get to some of the mailbag questions. There were some good ones, some bad ones. Uh, I put it out at the PME on Twitter. And again, if you have questions for another upcoming episode, maybe we'll do an all mailbag episode and I'll save some of these ones because I didn't think we'd get to over an hour just talking about this, but here we are already. Uh, and this one kind of goes straight into what we just talked about, about voiding bets and how you're allowed to bet unders. But yeah, the guy has, why is the public obsessed with betting overs? I think that's a pretty easy answer. Of course. I mean, like people want to root for an outcome, not against it. Like you put, you watch hockey, you want to root for goals. You watch basketball, football, you want to root for points. Um, that That's like anyone who's actually bet an under before and tried to watch a game through with that under would know why the, the public is obsessed with betting overs. It's just way easier to cheer for. Your bet is never dead until zero is on the clock. So um, I, I, I agree, Pat. I think that's a, a pretty simple one. All right. What other questions do we got here? Some decent ones uh, the, about the void is for the void my bet and it's rig crowd. I think we should ask them how it would feel if a book voids a bet because there should have been a flag or he didn't miss that block and it wouldn't have hit. I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> well, it, it is. But like for the void my bet crowd as well, right? 
let's say they the sports book voids all your overs. You bet a, a, a start. You bet Patrick Mahomes over passing yards. He leaves the game, doesn't come back, and the sports book says, "I'm going to void all these Patrick Mahomes overs." Guess what? They also have to pay out all the unders. They're not just voiding the market completely. Now they're just paying out essentially everyone who made a bet on that event. Like this is what people don't understand. Like they're like, oh, you know, sports books, like they're, they're trying to screw people over or whatever. And listen, it's a very profitable biz business to be a sports book. You're going to hold, you know, roughly five to 7% over a long period of time. Great business to be in if you can get enough players. But I also like, it's also unfair to the sports book. Like if they're just going to just keep paying out this stuff over and over. I, I mean, I could get into this stuff for days. I think part of it is just, with the it's rigged crowd, the voided bets crowd, this is what happens when you get an influx of new people in a space, right? Like 10 years ago, I was picking up envelopes in a shoebox, right? <laughs> I was going, meeting in, in like the sketchiest parts of town where I'd have no idea who, who was wait. Am I going to get paid this $15,000 or am I going to get a crowbar in the knees? Like I had no clue. And you think about that stuff. Imagine me showing up and like handing over an envelope one day and saying to the bookie, hey, dude, like this is unfair. Patrick Mahomes got hurt in the game and I bet the Chiefs like we need to avoid this. But they would have laughed me like like they would they, they would they, this would have been a talking point for them for the rest of their life. I can't believe like, can you believe what this guy asked me? And now this is calm. Like this is the thing in the space nowadays, but it's an influx of new betters who just haven't experienced this before. And the new betters bet overs. Again, you can bet an under. You're allowed to bet unders on player props. And guess what? If a player gets injured, you win that under for the most part. Like you're not rooting for injuries, but it's built into the line already. So uh, very, very frustrating topic for me, Pat. Uh, well, I mean, we should probably retire the topic because I think it's getting tiresome for a lot of people. Either people don't care or people just agree and move on their way and keep nodding. But I think you hit on the key point that the people that are doing this are generally brand new betters. And it is in the sports book's best interest to retain these new customers. <laughs> but is, so here's the thing. If I'm running a sports book and someone's just like, Oh, screw you, DraftKings. You're not going to refund this bet. I'm taking all my business to FanDuel or no, whatever. No, they aren't. No, they aren't. One, that's, there, there's a lot of empty promises there or empty <laughs> threats, I would say, where no, like that's a lot of work that somebody doesn't want to go through to withdraw, deposit into a new site. If they do go with that, then like that's probably not the player you want at DraftKings anyways. Like that, that type of person... That requires resources and yeah. customer service. Customer service. That's the whole thing. Like, what you have to dedicate for this low limit better to begin with just is simply not worth it for you. Honestly, there were offshores back in the days where like the the like the manager of that offshore sports book would literally just jump in the chat with you and be like, Oh, you want to go play at this other site? Great. I'll close out the account for you. You'll have your money in, in X amount of time. See you later. Don't let the, the, the door hit you in the ass on the way out type of situation and uh, i mean i don't know why like i don't know why the sports books care all that much honestly i really don't because like this is not the type of customer if i was building a sports book business do i want the customer that's going to complain about every single bet that they lost you, you don't like, you don't you don't but their email is valuable yes agreed because they, they have valid. they have now proven to be someone that will use their credit card to deposit money on a sports betting site and that's a very valuable list you can put together you want to talk about like different edges and different ways to make money in this industry a big email list can be very profitable it can be there's also uh some legality uh concerns with there because if you're collecting emails there are some rules and the you, know, sure. what you can and can't do with them I'm not saying that people will break those laws to make a buck, but yeah, agreed. There, there is value in the email and just being able to market to someone uh, because of having like their contact information. And knowing what they've previously purchased in the past, that makes them, I mean, it's, listen, sometimes I get emails based on things that I've signed up for, and then I'll get this random email from whatever list that I got. Joined. I was like, hey, I actually think this is a good idea. This, this is good that it was marketed to me. I am interested in that. So it's not just pure spam all the time. And like, I don't like to spam. I mean, I do my newsletter. That's where I get my emails from. Sub to my newsletter, by the way, so I can steal your email. It's down in the uh, <laughs> comment section down there. But I mean, I just throw stuff in that I think that people would like in my newsletter that I send out every single week. I mean, you can choose just to delete it or unsub if you want. Of course. But 
it, it's there. Uh, how much will daily fantasy be affected by the legalization of sports betting nationwide? I've already started to go from 1000 to 1500 a week, down to 300 to $400 a week, especially with same-game parlays for games. Used to love single-game showdowns, and now I barely play them for basketball or football now. I think this was always going to be the outcome, that daily fantasy was going to take the biggest hit in terms of sports betting. It just... Daily fantasy is, I mean, you talk about sports betting being hard. Daily fantasy is fucking difficult to figure out. Just the game theory, which is always changing based on how many people are doing one thing, the amount of leverage, the amount of tools. And essentially, if you're like playing football and you're trying to play for these giant prize pools, you're basically putting together a nine game player prop parlay that not only has to hit, but has to be better than someone else's nine game player prop parlay that goes through. So I would imagine the people that love throwing in a DraftKings lineup for a hundred bucks or whatever on a weekly basis now just play like a four game banger, same game parlay for a hundred bucks. Agreed. I, I mean, I definitely think the DFS sites have lost market share, will continue to lose market share as same game parlays increase. Uh, I mean, a lot of people uh, are just looking for lottery tickets uh, and it's pretty easy to do on sports books now with same game parlays. So that's definitely taken a dent out of the uh, the DFS sites. I've always wondered, and maybe you can answer this, Pat, but uh, I participate in season-long daily fantasy sports, which I stopped playing regular fantasy football about five years ago. And rather than running our, our league on Yahoo and doing the draft before the year and having to do the waiver wire pickups and set a lineup every week, we just switched over to DraftKings and said, let's just do a season long thing where we each pick a lineup every on week. DraftKings yeah. every week and we tally the point. I don't know why the the maybe you know, but like I don't know why the the DFS sites haven't pivoted in this direction. Like that's a big chunk of the market that you can just totally take where like they don't want to, to put in the, do all the work to put in waiver wire pickups every week. They don't want to do the draft. They don't want to have to deal with a player getting injured in week one and it costs them their entire season when they can just pick a fresh new lineup next week and it's still competitive. You could still have the exact same rules if you wanted to as a regular pool, whether that's head-to-head, -head, you know, points-only type of situation. I, I don't know why this is not... I'm struggling to understand why this is not a massive thing right now. Uh, I don't know. I play in a few of these myself. I'm in one for golf. I'm in one for football. I used to be in one for UFC, weirdly, like a few years ago that someone put together. Just it, It's fun to do. And yeah, I, I'm kind of over season-long fantasy football at this point. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why you've seen the proliferation of best ball. And I think that's where these companies went was best ball. Like between you and I and you know, the millions at home watching that I am pretty sure I'm going to be able to bring to market next year. Uh, PGA best ball, which I'm really excited about. And I think that there's going to be a market for it. And I'm shocked that, like, I know, uh, I think Underdog is doing one, but it's like yep. ma major season. It, this yep. I want to do, like, full season, like, draft a big team in golf and, you know, compete for big prizes, that kind of thing. Uh, I think we're going to be able to pull it off by the time golf comes around next year. Uh, but we have to make sure the tech is in place, everything like that. But I, I just like playing Daily Fantasy. So I, I'm not going to stop doing it. I mean, you live in Ontario. You can't do it. People have asked me about that, too, of why can't, like, when is DraftKings coming back to Ontario? I'm going to guess never. <laughs> um, there's issues with, like, cross-province liquidity pools. So I believe, and I'm not an expert in this, but I my understanding is that if DraftKings wanted to run contests in Ontario, it would have to be Ontario only. They could not share a liquidity pool with anything outside of Ontario. Also, I think something with the way that the uh, the gaming licenses are structured, that, that, I do not believe... That's it. It, 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 yeah. it. A big part of it is the taxation that goes into... Because we saw this when I ran the one and done pool this year. I work with Sports Hub on that. They're licensed in every single state uh, that they can be in uh, under fantasy law. But so something like Michigan, they passed sports book regulation. And essentially what they did is they boxed out any non DraftKings or FanDuel fantasy game. That was there because their taxes are so high on Sportsbook, and they essentially mimic that over to DFS. Same thing as Ontario did. They were like, here's our cut of the Sportsbook. We're also taking that cut of Daily Fantasy and DraftKings. Well, if the price is like 17% tax on every entry yep. that's put in on DraftKings, and they're taking a 13% rake, well, now they're just losing money by running contests. <laughs>
exactly. They can't. They literally cannot earn unless they are absolutely fleecing the player. And who's gonna who's gonna do that at that point? So I think it's just. Uh, uh, I mean, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, I, I was someone who was playing a lot of DraftKings daily fantasy. I can no longer do that in Ontario. I love the product. I uh, love to be able to do that on Sundays. Much preferred running a season long. DraftKings uh, fantasy contest versus a Yahoo one, uh, but here we are, unfortunately. But um, you can still you can still do DraftKings free contest, I think, in Ontario. I think we. I you, you might be right. I'm pretty sure we tried this because we always ran our pools on DraftKings. But did you? And, but did uh, you make it like worth like everyone has to put in fifty bucks that like every single week? Because you could do it where you could run a free league. And everyone yes. could play in it. And then you just exchange money. Use League Safe. League Safe is yes. like the best way to go about it. Because I know Paul Paul in the MMA industry just dealt with some dude who stole everyone's money. I think he, Paul, did he, that guy pay everyone back? He did. He did pay everyone back. All right. Wow. Well, a good thing he got bullied into paying everything back. But I mean, that's sort of the recourse of this. You talked about the offshore sports books. People can just go steal your money. And that's why I wanted to get linked up to do the one and done uh, with Sports Hub. Like they're a regulated company that has licenses in all these companies. They also own League Safe at the same time which is probably the number one place where you can store your money for any sort of pool. It's not going anywhere. And essentially it's, they've created the product. They keep your money in like escrow. They make their whatever percentage off of it and just pay you out when you want it back. I mean, that's the way to go about it, right? Like, you know, when I was working at the score, they were, they were going to launch a DFS product, which they did. It failed miserably, but it was like centered around all these private games and taking a rake on like all these friendly games. And my whole thing was like, people are just going to settle <laughs> offline. Like they're going to play the free game and they're all going to bet on it. And then they're going to go into the office on Monday and they're going to exchange the cash. No one's going to play the $20 game where you're raking, you know, $2 off of it. No one is going to do that. Um, but yeah, that's the way to go about it, obviously. So that's kind of what we were doing. We were leveraging the DraftKings platform for free and settling offline. Um probably the best way to go about it but i season long dfs like honestly if you're out there and you you invest way too much time in like regular fantasy football on a weekly basis this will change your life because you put together a lineup like 20 minutes before the game starts on sunday and that's all you're doing it takes five minutes like it's and you still have the same exact level of interest in the games the same rooting interest in players um it, I can't recommend it enough. Why aren't more people doing content around gambling on esports? I have the answer for this one, by the way. Super open market that feels like most books don't have proper handle on, from my experience, compared to traditional sports. Big, big plus money underdogs win outright often in most of the games. I think it's the crowd honestly, that follows esports. And like we tried, when I was at Fantasy, they tried to start an esports channel too because you know there was like a two-year period. Remember ESPN was showing esports? And I remember mm -hmm. Len Asper walked in with like the other guys in church, like esports is the next big thing. It's like, well, it already is a big thing, but here's the thing. People are just streaming it on Twitch. They don't want to pay for your fucking channel to watch esports when they're already watching it for free. And most of the audience, I mean, it probably has matured into that now. This isn't a sports betting audience. Like, those are two distinctly different things. People watch esports for totally different reasons. Like, random people who watch sports because they love the Philadelphia Eagles aren't necessarily going to be sports bettors. But it feels like the majority of that esports crowd, from what I saw, trying to produce content behind the scenes to get people to bet on it there was just no interest so i think covid taught us a lot about esports because when all the north american sports leagues went away everyone was like this is going to be like the boom for esports now right like people have been waiting for this for years for it to take off in the betting space and it didn't People didn't start just betting on esports because it was the only thing around they were literally people were literally betting on chess more than they were betting on esports or Madden simulations, like actually <laughs> watching like two computer teams play one another be, instead of betting on esports. It's a different crowd that, that that sports betting just doesn't appeal to them as much. On top of that, I've done a lot of um, research on esports because I'm not a huge gamer myself, but I'm I'm kind of interested in like this crowd in specific. But a lot of the existing sports book products actually just do not appeal to esports betters um there's something about like an esports better 
the way that you spell esports, for example, <laughs> whether you hyphenate the E to the S, uh, capital S, or all lowercase, like one of those is correct. And if you're if you don't do that, you basically look like a complete asshole to people in the esports community who are never ever going to bet on your site because they're like, no, these guys don't take it seriously. Like they're not taking what I, what I like to bet on seriously. We are seeing some like esports specific gaming sites start to pop up now. Um, I, I still think that there might be an appetite for betting on it down the few, like down the road, but I don't think sportsbooks understand how to appeal to that demographic. And I really don't think that demographic is all that interested in betting on the matches right now. Right now. And maybe, cause I mean, I think the whole goal was try to figure out sports betting and try to ingrain that into the, I, I actually do not know what the average age of someone who watches esports is. I assume it's like 16, 17, 18 into your early 20s and then grow the sports book when that audience grows older. But in terms of COVID, I remember betting on marbles during COVID. But I have to think yep. that the two biggest winners in the sports betting space during COVID were MMA and golf because they were the first ones back. 100%. I totally agree with you there. Um yeah, MMA, Dana White was sending up, setting up that series on like whatever island they were operating on or whatever. But those events were doing a, a large amount of handle. I talked to many people about that. Um, and I, I, I think like golf in general is just growing pretty rapidly in North America. Uh, players have become more marketable. But I, I think that you're right, Pat. I think the, the return from COVID and that being like the only thing going on really, really helped the PGA Tour. What is the reluctance of allowing betting on college sports, especially in states with very few D1 schools? Is it still the Arizona State scandal almost 30 years ago, or is it something else that's holding up so many states from legalization? I think this is like a state-by-state -state weird thing that they have written into like university something something. Like it's some weird part of each state law that either you can do it or you can't. It's, it's bizarre. Yep. <laughs> yeah, same in Illinois. I know friends who lives in Chicago can't bet on any of the... Uh... Illinois University college football teams or whatever. Uh, it, I mean, most states do this because of a like um, Arizona State ex scandal example is one of them. But just like the fear of, um, you know, I don't want to say fixed matches, but just like, yeah, fixed matches. Like there's a fear. Part of this stems from regulators that honestly just don't know what they're doing because the likelihood of this type of stuff happening, especially if you run like, if you look at the UK model right now, they can easily pinpoint whenever there's like weird activity on a game and they can investigate that and say, oh, OK, like something's going on here. And that stuff just happens less and less and less. We're still ways behind that in terms of regulation across North America. There's no like neutral party that's just analyzing all the bets that are coming in to monitor weird activity. But all of this is easily avoidable. There shouldn't be like this is a prehistoric um, law or ruling, in my opinion. But it does stem from uh, the ability to influence the outcomes of games. Well, now that the what is it? The NIL? Is that what it's called? Is in effect? Yep. Like, who cares? Exactly. Agreed. With all the data and analytics easily at our disposal, what can be said for just straight up vibes and gut feelings? I think if listen. As you mentioned, even people who pass themselves off as pro betters win at a 1% rate or whatever. Like, I think Cam is the best example of this. And Cam's actually, weirdly enough, for as much shit as we give Cam, he's actually, like, not bad at picking games. <laughs> like, he's pretty good. Cody's the same way in, in UFC. Like, he's not really putting any thought into, like, lines or probability. Just he understands MMA. He feels like this style over that style. Well, I think this guy is going to win. So I'm going to bet that guy. I don't care what the line is. Not probably the most advantageous way of doing it. But if you're not a pro better and you're betting for entertainment, I don't care how you bet. So that kind of stuff, like my, my, you can quantify that. Like one style versus another in MMA, you can quantify that in some way. Now, am I saying that everyone who, like who's going to win at betting needs a model to win at betting? No, you don't. Some people are able to just handicap games and they know what's important. And they can kind of put the right accurate price on the game in their head and they can work their way through things that way. Um, I mean, like you mentioned Cam, like Cam's a great example of someone who I think with more principles could be a very successful better. Cam's issue would be more so with bankroll management, yeah. right? <laughs> and playing too many games and parlaying games and chasing losses on days where things are going bad. And so, and those are just like principles that 
over time they can be taught but some people just get like rooted in in bad habits so to speak but for sure i mean listen what i try to do is i you know i model sports this is just the way that i beat them you know I, and i'll often watch a game or a, a team just doesn't pass like the eye test for me and this is it's tricky because like you don't want to develop like personal biases you don't want to bias your model in any way but i literally make notes over the course of the entire nfl season of like i'm noticing this i'm going to investigate this in the off season i'm noticing this i'm going to investigate it in the off season so i think there's certainly things that i catch that i'm not quantifying in a model right now but my whole goal over time is to find a way to incorporate that into the model investigate it see if it's actually something that exists are um games called differently by referees at home versus road or time of year or whatever i'm just throwing out random examples but gut and feel in my opinion and again anyone can disagree uh i think it's extremely unlikely that someone is going to profit at sports betting in the long run by just using gut and feel we develop too many biases as human beings um and people do not become like people don't think probabilistically enough in order to be successful at doing that. They just think in terms of this team is going to win or this team is going to win. They don't think say to themselves, oh, this team has a 60% chance of winning. This team has a 40% chance of winning. I think you need to think like the latter in order to be profitable at betting sports. Uh, shout out to my guy, Ryan Noonan over at BetSports for this one at R-Y. N O O N A N on Twitter, if you want to go follow him, which I suggest that you do. Uh, he found like a weird scoring discrepancy on home teams in the NFL generously giving out tackles and assists in bulk yep. in certain teams and then betting these over tackle props on guy safeties on the home team at like four and a half this year. And he absolutely cleaned up. I'm sure that is not going to be an inefficiency going into next year. Right. So the market always catches up to this type of stuff. Like, in, in fact, it might actually overcorrect at some point. We see this happen oftentimes. But, yeah, there's stuff like that out there all the time. Like, for me, hockey better, shots on goal props. There are certain home scorekeepers who are more lenient in what they would consider to be a shot for their home players. There's There are biases in that as well, and you can figure them out. They just don't last forever. Um, eventually, it gets out there. More people bet it, and then the market corrects. And what often happens is this then becomes a public thing. Everybody knows about it. And the market actually overcorrects to the point where you actually have value in betting the other side. So next time we get together and do this, because there's still like 50 more questions. Obviously, we're not going to get through them today. Most of them deal with the creation of betting lines, how to monitor live lines. And I know that you've worked on that side of the sports book, or at least have some insight to that. So I think that's something we can talk about next time, because that's a very lengthy answer, I'm sure, about the creation of a line all the way through to when the lines are going on. But I want to end with this, and we'll talk about that next time. Again, leave any more questions that you may have down in the comment section. We'll talk about those the next time we go through them mailbag do you think that chat gpt can be used to predict or model sporting outcomes chat gpt was like ai technology basically yeah, yeah. So, so there is like um there are like machine learning models now this is not my area of expertise so i'm going to just point it out there i've done some stuff with people in terms of machine learning that they just throw all this data like literally just dumping data upon data upon data into a machine and the computer program is going to figure out what's important and what's not. And it's going to start to model based off of that. This is beyond my area of expertise for sure. But in doing something like that, you end up creating a black box. And I do. So I do think that there's value in this and there's some people that can make it work. But for me, the way I model games, just using Monte Carlo simulations as an example, when something goes haywire and something goes wrong, I can go back to my model and pinpoint where it's going haywire, where it's going wrong, why a specific output is coming that way. Once you get into the AI side of things and the machine learning side of things, you're kind of screwed when that happens. Like you start to get outputs and you have no idea where they're coming from. You can't reverse engineer this and say like, oh, you know, th this is why this is happening. It's like, no, you just dumped a bunch of data in computer have tried to figure out what's valuable and started you know, outputting these, these outputs on the games. 
And now you have a line where a team is a three point favorite in the NFL and your computer says they should be a 17 and a half point favorite. And you're like, this is obviously wrong. You don't really know where to go about getting that fixed or why that output happened. I do think that there's value in it. I do think over time, just like everything else in life, it's becoming more and more automated. Technology plays a bigger factor. I'd be an idiot if I completely dismissed that. But I still think that we're ways away from that because um, from a modeling, pure modeling standpoint, uh, it becomes inherently challenging to like figure out why specific things are happening. That will do it on the Pat Mayo experience. I, I enjoyed this a lot. I, I hope people enjoy it as well. If you did enjoy this show and you think we should do more of these things, uh, tweet at Rob, tweet at me, and just you know, let us know. And tell us down in the comment section as well. Check out the hammer.bet for your sports betting needs, where you can find all of Rob's content as well. You can obviously find all of my stuff here on Mayo Media Network. So please subscribe on YouTube, subscribe to the audio podcast, support everything so we can continue giving free bets. Free bets. And I don't run out of money and I have to just disingenuously sell picks to you at some point, which will just make me look very, very terrible. So smash the like, please, if you're out there for us, okay? Uh, we'll be back next week with. Uh, Cam and make our Super Bowl best bets. But until then, I'm Pat Mayo, and I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo experience. Experience.